of the Board, Mount Vernon Board of Education please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk, please call the roll. <coughs> Trustee Mitchell. Trustee Patterson. Present. Trustee Miller. Here. Trustee Williams. Here. Trustee McOwen. Present. Trustee Ning. Trustee Saunders. Here. Trustee White. Present. Trustee Torres. Present. Quorum is present. Thank you. Dr. Hamilton, do you have any presentations this evening? We do this evening. Uh, we are very proud to have students in our midst. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's communications from the public. Do we have? Yeah. We're doing the the presentation just okay. that one. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, we are very pleased to have students in our midst. I'm going to ask Dr. Collins if she will come and just give us the setup and then introduce the students. Good Dr. Collins, I'm sorry. There's a microphone right behind you. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here and to present a scene from our production that's happening next week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's a play entitled Seven Guitars by August Wilson. It's our second August Wilson production. Uh, we're very proud to be the only school in the state and really the country that's tackling August Wilson, and we're hoping to do all ten of his shows. So this is one of two, two of ten. So we've already produced... Um, what did we do? Ma Rainey's Ma Black Ra Bottom. I was just testing you. <laughs> <laughs> we already produced Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And so this year we're presenting um, Seven Guitars. So it's set in 1948, backyard of like a boarding house. Seven characters have come together. It's um, told in flashback. One of the main characters have died. And so these are all of his friends. So the scene you're about to see is when they're listening to the fight. Um, Joe Lewis is in the uh, ring and he's fighting. And so we have our announcer children come. Um, it'll make sense. We're playing it this way, so you guys should we sit over there? Back. You should sit over yeah. here. <coughs> and thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Lewis sticks out another left and a right to the head, and they tie up on the inside. The referee breaks them apart. Lewis has been making good use of that jab. They're in the center of the ring now, and Lewis tries out another jab and misses with a left hook. Khan grabs and holds. Khan throws a right to the body and a left to the head. Lewis counters with a left hook, sticks out a jab and a right that grazes Khan's head as Khan retreats to the rope and Lewis tries to pin him there, but Khan punches his way out. Khan fires a hard right to Lewis's head. Lewis backs up and Khan fires a hard right cross and tries to double on the left. Lewis takes a step back, bobs and weaves and works his way on the inside and clinches. That punch hurt Lewis. Khan tries to take advantage and fires a left and a right to the head. Lewis is holding on as a referee Marty Blaine breaks them apart. Ooh, Lewis gonna get him! Lewis misses with a left, misses with a right. Khan with a hard left hook to Lewis's head. He really wound up that time and Lewis ducks a left and a right and fires a right cross to the head. Another right. A right lead catches Khan high on the forehead as both men clinch. Luis backs out, throws a left and a hard right that drops Khan to one knee. Ooh, the black man hit hard, you know. The referee is counting over him, and Khan appears to be all right as he takes a count of seven. He's on his feet, and the referee wipes off his gloves. They're in mid-ring now. Luis fires a left and a right, a hard right, a left, and a straight right that knocks Khan down. 
He's flat on his back. His eyes are closed. It's all over. It's all over. Joe Lewis is knocked out. Yeah. Yeah. You next. You and Red Carl. 
Go ahead, Louise. Two. Three. Four. Pass. Buzz. Now, here's what I don't understand. If I go out there and punch a white man in the mouth, they give me five years in jail, even if there ain't no witnesses. Joe Lewis beat a white man in front of 100,000 people, and they gave him a million dollars. Now you explain that to me. He got a license, and you don't. He registered with the government, and you ain't. Which trunks? Clubs. Who said it was clubs? I do. That's what I did. You said past. Where you been at? Come to the table. I can play on anything. It don't matter to me what it is. Hey, boy, watch it. I just said it was Trump's. I can play him that too. Lord ain't got his mind on the game. I know. Fair, you sent him hundreds of dollars this year? Yeah. If Lord give me some great papers. I get you some. What kind you want? Red and white? Three rolls of red and three rolls of white. And one roll of green paper. I'll get you some tomorrow. <laughs> if I had my BB gun, I'll kill that rooster. That'd be a warning to the duck. Ain't that the truth? What's she look like with that rooster? All she gotta do is go down to the Woolworths and get her a locker. They don't cost but a dollar and forty nine cents. <laughs> Very well done, students. As I see you're leaving, just wanted to say great job, and I'm looking forward to opening night. Thank you. Thank you uh, for coming. Um, guys, this uh, before you go, guys, I, I just want to let you know on behalf of the board, um, you, you guys just embodied the reason we're here, like what you're doing here. I mean, I'm so proud of us. You know, and you guys just do such an amazing job to roll out and, you know, actually fulfill the vision that the entire community has uh, for each and every one of us. Uh, and it's so moving, so great. So just please just keep focused and also grab someone else who's not so focused and pull them in because you guys are great. Yeah, we're proud of you. Keep up the great work. Are there any? Uh, oh, we're going to go, go back to, right to right communications. Right. Okay. Do we have any communications from the public this yes, evening? Yes, we do. Good, good evening. Okay. Thank you. 
The Mount Vernon Board of Education recognizes the critical importance of community discourse and involvement in the education of Mount Vernon's children. And accordingly, members of the public are invited to speak at each regularly scheduled board meeting subject to the terms of board policy. Speakers must register in advance no later than 4 p.m. on the date of the meeting by contacting myself, the district clerk, at 914-665-5235 in person at 165 North Columbus Avenue or by email at rmccormack at mtvernoncsd.org. The board welcomes all respectful comment, whether praise or criticism. However, identifying and criticizing a specific student, parent, teacher, administrator, or other Mount Vernon education official or employee is strictly prohibited. Such complaints must be presented and addressed through the proper administrative channels. Each speaker will be allotted three minutes to speak, with up to an additional minute to be used for the speaker to summarize and conclude their remarks. If appropriate, board trustees or the superintendent or his designee may respond to a speaker's remarks at the conclusion of public comment period. Our first speaker this evening is John Roke. Hi, everybody. Thanks Thank for having me here. Uh, just by way of introduction, my name's John Roke. I'm a lifelong Mount Vernon resident, 1982 graduate of Mount Vernon High School, Columbus School, and also uh, the uh, Davis Middle School. Um, so thank you for giving me this time. I sent a letter to Dr. Hamilton, but if you'd indulge me, I'd like to read the letter, please. Sure. I promise there are no complaints. <laughs> um, so I, I wrote to Dr. Hamilton, and I said, I am writing to ask that you and the trustees of the Mount Vernon Board of Education Please consider naming the new Mount Vernon High School baseball field the Joe Mazzella baseball field. As you are likely aware, Coach Mazzella was the Mount Vernon High School varsity baseball coach from 1979 through 2008. And during that time, he compiled a record of 425 wins against 249 losses or a 631 winning percentage. That's nearly 675 total games. It's my recollection that his 425 wins ranks in the top five for high school baseball in Westchester County history, and there was a stretch during the 1980s when his teams won more than 80% of their games. We have another coach uh, amongst uh, us th uh, these days, Bob Sumino, who routinely wins around 80% of his game. Yakov may know a little bit about that. Bobby was my CYO coach, so I know a little bit about it too. That's correct. In addition, Coach Mazzella's teams won 14 league titles, which is just about one every two years, and a sectional title in 1981. I was lucky enough to be a member of the 1981 team, and that sectional title is one of only two, the other in 1978 in Mount Vernon High School history. There's no doubt that Coach Mazzella would be the first to tell you that while coaching 674 baseball games and countless practices, the AstroTurf room at Mount Vernon High School is well used. I have the scars to prove it. He was blessed with good players, some of whom played baseball in college, and a select few signed professional contracts. He had good assistant coaches too, but I say the following without any hyperbole. The only person that was there for the entirety of the 29 years was Coach Mazzella. Coach Maz was not only a baseball coach, but he was a teacher too. And many of the things he preached to his players during practices and games including attention to detail, consistency, discipline, respect, and structure, helped them become better men. Not only did we become men, but at team get-togethers, we're a band of Mount Vernon High School baseball brothers. The next get-together will be in two weeks. Please know that I'm available to speak to you, as I mentioned in the letter, and I thank you very much for allowing me this time. I'm free to answer any of your questions, and if, if possible, I'll add any details should you desire. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming out this evening and sharing that information with the board. Do any Thank trustees you. have questions? Yes, Joe, uh, Joe Mazzella is still. definitely still with us. Um, he, he's, uh, he's an amazing friend. He's an amazing person. Um, I, I, I second, you know, um, you know your, your, the, the commitment to, you know, considering him. Um, just a great person. I, actually, I had no idea really of his winning percentage and all those things are good. Um, but he has affected so many, so many people. So, I mean, it's definitely something to consider and, and think about and definitely appreciate you bringing it. Thank you. Forward. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you for coming you. out Thank this you. evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jarit Anderson. Ms. Anderson. Our final speaker this evening is Gloria Pope. 
that concludes public comment. Thank you. Dr. Hamilton, do you want to continue with your presentation? I do. Uh, this evening, we are very pleased to have a representative from the New York School Boards Association, Mr. Patrick Longo. If you'll take the microphone, please. Good evening. Okay. My name is Patrick Longo. I'm the Member Relations Manager at New York State School Boards Association. And I want to thank the board tonight for having us here. Uh, we are here to actually present recognition for a program at your district. And I just wanted to talk about how we came to this point and why we give this recognition. Uh, we have a service called Eclipse. I'm sure the board, you've probably seen it. You might read it, it comes out every day. And if you notice, a lot of times in the press, we see a lot of negative. And sometimes the positive just kind of gets drowned out. And so we want to put a highlight and a spotlight on more positive things going on at the districts all across the state. And I actually, if you recall, I visited your district last year, actually. Yes. I had a great conversation with you. And kind of peppered through that conversation, I kind of asked about what's going on at the district. And he told me some things. And so we've been looking out for positive things at the district now for the past year. And the program is called Champions of Change for Kids. And the important thing is change. There's a lot of change. Sometimes change, you know, we have good change, we have some bad change. But I recall back when I actually graduated from high school, way back in 1987, I was the last class that didn't have to take a language to get my, uh, my Regents degree. You didn't have to take Spanish, Latin, French, nothing. You could just graduate with the Regents degree. I took business. But I remember at the time, there was something called coding. And all these people were coding, and these guys were meeting these, these back rooms and kind of learning this new language. And we didn't realize then how much it was going to change the world. And we didn't know who was going to be doing it and to what extent coding would change the world. And so we heard about a program at your school. And uh, if you could come down here, I'd like to present the award. So on behalf of New York State School Boards Association, okay. our board, our executive director, Robert Schneider, and our staff, I'd like to present Mount Vernon City School District okay. Board of Education, the coding camp for middle school girls of color, the champions of change for kids in the Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I just want to comment because I have to tell you that I do read Eclipse and I have often mentioned that I uh, seldom see any uh, articles about Mount Vernon and there's so much um, positive energy and so many accomplishments that we are achieving in the district that I've often wondered why I haven't seen anything in there. So I do read that. Um, and this gives me a lot of pleasure and a lot of joy and a lot of pride to be able to receive this on behalf of the district, for the district. And I'm looking forward to more positive uh, activity and uh, energy in the district. So thank you for this recognition for our camp and our students. Okay. Thank you. Well done. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Um, I, you know, it's often, it, it's sometimes when you're in the midst of the work, you don't always see it from the outside. Um, so it's always good to have folks for outside the boundaries of Mount Vernon recognize your work. So um, on behalf of the board and the students, thank you for, and please thank the association <coughs> for recognizing the district for our work and accomplishments. <coughs> Stay tuned because the best is yet to come. Okay, thank, thank, so thank you.
And we have one more presentation this evening. Uh, Dr. B.C., you want to do the setup for me, please, the introductions, please? Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. This evening, we have in our midst Dr. Beth Posner. Is that correct? Right, Dr. Beth Posner from Smile Dental, who is going to share with you some of the services that we're going to offer in all our schools. We had it, you know, many years ago, but then because we had to renew the contracts and all of that with the New York State Department, it has been approved, and now she, is, she will share with you exactly what's going to take place in the schools. We are trying to provide as many services as possible to our students and to our parents with that they have to pay for it. So with that being said, Dr. Posner, you won't need to come. Hello, board, and thank you, Dr. Bennett Conroy, and thank you, Dr. <coughs> Hamilton, for having me. And I guess this is perfectly fortuitous to be able to follow on good news, because this is more good news. And we are absolutely thrilled, and we congratulate Mount Vernon on uh, bringing in-school dental care to your students at nine of your elementary schools. The sheet I'm handing out basically talks about why Smile New York does this work. We're not only in Mount Vernon, we're in other towns in Westchester and all throughout the five boroughs of New York City. In Mount Vernon, when we were here last, we provided in-school dental care at no cost for nearly 2,200 of your students. These are kids we know who aren't accessing care in their communities. We also know that dental disease is the number one illness of childhood. Every time I say it, I'm a dentist and I wanna pass out, but it's true. And we also know it's preventable. And so by working with you great partners in your elementary schools, we can have children access that essential preventative care to get them on the path of health and prevent that pain that has been known to linger with kids so long they don't even know why or what's causing the headache. And when someone takes the time to look in their mouth and see that it's a tooth and then can get them that advanced care to resolve that, all of a sudden their pain's gone away, perhaps for the first time in their lives, and they can sit and access curriculum in class where they probably weren't able to do so before. So really from the bottom of our hearts at Smile New York, we are passionate about this work. We're thrilled to be back in Mount Vernon. We come into a space right at school that, we are, that you lend us. Parts of gyms, parts of libraries, auditorium stages, teacher lounges, all kinds of classrooms if we're lucky. We set up a proper and real dental office. Come see us sometimes. You'll be blown away, I am. And with great school partners, we enroll those kids and we provide cleaning exam, fluoride sealants, and, and x-rays if needed. Further care, we work very hard to refer those kids into the community. And we now have a fixed site, Smile New York office on Cretona Parkway in the Bronx. So easy for your students to get to. And so it's just a perfect synergy for Mount Vernon. There is no cost to schools and there's no cost to families. We do submit to insurance, that's the law, but there's never a follow-up bill to any family or child who's, any child, we can only treat children, although we get asked to treat families, but unfortunately we can't. Um, any, of, any of that care done at school, there's never a bill for. So we really, really congratulate you. We're thrilled to be back, and I thank Dr. Bennett Conroy very, very much for her support and all of you as well. Thank you, thank you so much for what you do for our kids. Your service is desperately needed and appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Posner, on behalf of the board as well. So now we're gonna move on to committee reports. Um, and we've consolidated both the committee and board member reports. I have a report. Oh, I'm sorry, did you have something? Yes, I do. Okay, I have a superintendent's report. That's okay. okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, share a couple of items with, with the board and members of the public this evening. 
Um, tomorrow, our school physician, Dr. Ma, will be conducting an information session with our school nurses and next week with our building principals to share a consistency in how each school is responding to the coronavirus outbreak. Um, we have also been consistently updating our website with important information. As soon as we get information from the CDC or the State Department of Health, we are updating that information and posting it as appropriate. And uh, the superintendents are also having a round, the county superintendents are also having a round table tomorrow in response to how we will address the coronavirus should our schools be impacted. Um, also, Mr. Silver and I attended Lobby Day in Albany this week. We were able to meet with representatives from Senator Mayer's office, Senator B uh, Bailey's office, and Assemblyman Predlow. Um, it would be very helpful for them to hear from our community. Um, particularly about the state's obligation to ensure that Mount Vernon receives its fair share of state funding. Um, we are posting on our website a link called How Can I Advocate for My District? And on that link, you will find sample letters that you can send. I'm going to really ask our PTA presidents, our parent liaisons, to please take this initiative very seriously. Um, the governor is going to be presenting his budget soon, and the more voices he hear from, hears from Mount Vernon, the more likely it will be that we will be able to increase our state funding and therefore reduce the obligation to our local taxpayers. All in all, I think the meeting was very, very productive, very, uh, it was very personal, very intimate, and to the extent that it was a one-on-one -on -one conversation where we could talk very specifically about our needs and make our specific requests. Um, I also attended a parent information session at Edward Williams this week. Parents raised concerns about some of the building needs there. Specifically, they requested that doors be replaced and rekeyed, playground equipment, and some other aesthetics on the exterior of the building. Some of the <coughs> concerns can be addressed rather immediately. Others will require a significant contribution uh, or designation and, and, des and designation specific to capital projects. I did explain to them that in spite of the tremendous progress we have made in our district regarding repairing our facilities, it's merely a drop in the bucket in comparison to what there is to do. We are still trying to combat years and years and years of significant decline and neglect of our buildings and facilities. So we continue to ask the public to be patient with us as we work to allocate funds to capital projects and try not to have those capital projects and competition, competition for other resources in the district. But it was also a very productive meeting. And thank you, Dr. Waterman, for your leadership in setting that up. And to our family liaisons, all those um, who make this job so much easier than it would otherwise be. And lastly, it is with great pleasure that I announce one of our students, Edwina Belazar, is a senior at Nellie Thornton High School. She has been accepted with a full scholarship to North Carolina AT&T's Honors Program as an electrical engineering student. Oh, <laughs> And we're going to present her with the Nightlight Award at the next uh, next month's board meeting. Um, but she's receiving the prestigious Lewis and Elizabeth Dowry, Downey uh, Scholarship. And this scholarship is awarded to only 20 students nationwide. It covers enrichment activities, tuition, mandatory fees, room board, and a book stipend. Uh, so all together, and it's for all four years. So all together, she will get over $130,000. And we are Mount Vernon proud of Edwina and wish her the very best as she joins another student of ours from previous years, Aggie Nation. And that concludes the superintendent's report for this Fantastic. evening. Fantastic. That's great news. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton, for sharing more good news. Yes. More great news. You're quite welcome. Okay. Now we're ready to move on to the next item on the agenda, our committee reports. Um, so do we court com committee and or board member reports. Um, so I will start at that end of the table. Trustee Saunders, would you like to present oh, I was going to segue off for Trustee White's uh, committee report, okay. if, that, right. if that's, that's okay. Fine. That's fine. Right. Trustee White, would you like to My committee your report, report um, yep. Mike Policcio mm -hmm. will handle. <laughs> Assist you. <laughs> Assist, yes, she's, he's assisting me. Good evening. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Michael. Um, tonight, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing um, for, with our part for the coronavirus that we have um, that's been 
all over the news every minute of every day. So we also monitor the health reports from both the state and the county level. We turn them over. It goes through my office. If there's significant stuff on the report, we turn it into the superintendent's office and, to, and or to Rick McCormick for it to be placed onto the website for information for the entire public. The first thing I want to tell you is that this Thursday from 1 to 2 p.m., there will be a Q&A um, given by the State Health Department and uh, also with New York City and the Department of Health in Westchester County. Um, it is a webinar, and I have information for it, and I will give it to um, the district clerk to post on the website, but it seems to be a very informative webinar, and I suggest and recommend anybody who has time to be able to go through it and, and participate in it. The corona cases so far, as of this morning, are 92,819 worldwide, 3,164 3, deaths, and about 50,000 people have recovered from the virus. The U.S. has 100 confirmed cases, six deaths, all deaths were in Washington State. A woman in Manhattan has become the first coronavirus case reported in New York, and we also have one in Westchester County. <coughs> the virus has been confirmed in the following states, Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona, Nebraska, Texas, Florida, New York, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. Everyone can do their part here, and um, the recommendations from the county and the state is as you know, there are certain things that we can do to keep us safe. And those are pretty rudimentary things like washing your hands constantly, um, monitoring close proximity to people, um, during food service, watch um, how bodily fluids are, like in sneeze rails, how things are um, exposed to the foods. The other thing that we're doing in the district is we are doing an electrostatic um, surface cleaning with Clorox Total 360. It is a, and I have a short presentation, a three minute video will tell you exactly what it does, but it kills almost every virus on contact. All of the, all of the strands that are out there now, the ones we do know, only the ones we do know, obviously we can't cure anything we don't know anything about. but. It is very effective. It's being used on many school districts throughout the state. Can you play that video, please? Throughout your facility, hundreds of hard-to-cover surfaces could be covered with pathogens that cause and spread illness. It's difficult to get to these surfaces to sanitize or disinfect them, and the stakes couldn't be higher. Illness in the workplace costs the U.S. $576 billion a year. Absenteeism costs companies an average of $1,685 per employee. And viral outbreaks can devastate any organization. It cost a major university over $400,000 to combat a norovirus outbreak. There are approximately 725,000 reported healthcare-associated infections each year and up to $45 billion is spent treating HAIs. Traditional disinfecting methods like trigger sprays, foggers, misters, and mops provide only limited coverage. <coughs> to reduce cause and cost at source, we need a game changer, an entirely new, extremely effective, and cost-efficient way to deliver superior coverage. The Clorox Total 360 system is here. A revolutionary way to reach and kill pathogens almost anywhere. It combines the superior surface coverage of proven technology with the proven effectiveness of Clorox disinfectants and sanitizers. First, the electrostatic sprayer system turns the liquid into small droplets. Then, the sprayer applies a charge to each drop, so they're attracted to and adhere to surfaces with a force greater than gravity. The coverage is superior. It spreads over, under, and around surfaces. With Clorox Total 360 disinfectant cleaner in the system, you can kill MRSA, cold and flu viruses, norovirus, E. coli, and salmonella in places that could have been easily missed. The system gives you coverage far superior to conventional tools. With trigger sprayers, you might miss areas. 
Foggers and misters don't provide uniform coverage. Our electrostatic spraying system provides some of the most advanced and comprehensive disinfecting and sanitizing available. The Clorox Total 360 system also saves you time, money, and labor. You can cover up to 300 square feet in just 60 seconds. In an hour, up to 18,000 square feet, compared to only 3,900 square feet an hour with a trigger spray. The system uses much less labor than trigger sprayers. The system uses product effectively and efficiently, and it takes 12 trigger spray bottles to equal the coverage of just one jug of Clorox Total 360 disinfectant cleaner. The Clorox Total 360 system is an extremely effective way to help stop the spread of pathogens that cause infectious diseases. The Clorox Total 360 system is a century of cleaning expertise in revolutionary technology. The Clorox Total 360 electrostatic sprayer, when used with Clorox Total 360 disinfectant cleaner, provides the superior coverage to keep your facility healthy and productive. To learn more or request a demo, just call your distributor. So currently the district owns three of those machines. We have currently put in a pretty aggressive schedule that hits each and every one of the buildings and it, it's, you know, it's like painting a bridge. Finish and you just keep going right back around again. So we are, we've started already. We've entered every one of the schools. A place like Mount Vernon High School where we have to, instead of deploying a single machine, we deploy all three machines at one, for one day there. And then each of the other smaller schools, they get one machine and that, take, and that could take care of the entire school. Also, we are um, a, trying to get some funding to get the Purell hand sanitizers, the ones on the stands for each and every building at the entranceway to every building and maybe the entranceway to the cafeteria. We're also using the 360, as I said, and we're also um, going to be displaying signage similar to these type of signs. They're colorful, they're for the kids. It just reminds them to wash their hands, um, how to wash their hands thoroughly, what to do if they're feeling ill on how to guard themselves and not to use their hands to catch their sneezes and their coughs. So it has some really good effective tools that we think. So we think that we're clearly doing our part with this. We're, we're, we're not leaps and bounds ahead of anybody, but we're right where we should be, and we're, 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 we're secure in the fact that we will touch each and every building several times during this um, outbreak. Thank you. Any questions for um, Mr. Policcio? I have, I have a question. You said you're going to touch each and every single building. What's the cycle like? So presumably, if you send the three machines to Mount Vernon High School for one day, how often will you touch each building? Will it be every two weeks, every three days? How, how does the schedule, what is the schedule? Or so the schedule, like? it takes, so we have 16, 17 properties, 16 build, active buildings, and we have three machines. So we're constantly on, on the elementary days, we can do three schools in one day. When it's the secondary schools, the larger schools, each one of those schools okay. will be one day. So we're hoping if we can do some Saturday work, we're hoping every 10 days or so we'll be cycling through each of the schools. Okay. And of course, if there's any, any information that we get from a principal, uh, maybe absentees are a high and, or there's a report of you know, colds or flus that are in the school, we'll, we'll prioritize that school and return there. I'd like to try in the next budget to get a couple of more of the machines. They're actually, it, ideally, it would be great to have one for each school, and then we could do this every day as part of routine cleaning. What is the cost of each machine? They're about $5,000 a piece, and we own three of them. So my question was okay, uh, with prioritizing. Please. So are we working with the school nurses to get information on, you know, how many students, like you just said, um, are out and how to, you know, like so right now, we've only, we've done it in isolation through my department. So we, we're only just doing it as part of our routine. Our plan in the next couple of days is to loop in the principals. And I would assume at that point, because that's their report, that they would then loop in the nurse. And of course, if anything that we, any information that we need from health services, we will op obtain on our own. But right now, we're just doing it as part of our routine. And we're about to loop in the principals uh, on the building level. So the machine is five thousand. How much? How much is this actual spray stuff? 
Um, I don't know the cost of the, of the uh, I don't have that available right now. I will get that to you. It, it is far more cost effective than trigger sprays, like four to one, because oh, yeah. yeah. it, it, it's based on volume. Can I, I'm sorry, um, just because the gentleman on the video was wearing a mask, um, how safe is that machine for the person who's operating it? So according to the specs, and I do have the specs for all the solutions, and we could post them on the website as well. The specs call, allow, now he was wearing a protective mask, but I think that's more for splashing and stuff like that. Not that there's any of this is splashing, but for other cleaning issues that he has. According to their specs, you can do this in an occupied room. You can apply this in an occupied room. And you can spray it on this piece of paper. And because of the electrostatic that is in the, the energized particles, the paper is not affected. So we're not worried about ruining anybody's homework or anything that's left in somebody's desk. It's a really amazing product. I must say, um, I saw it at a trade show two years ago. I asked Mr. Silver and the boss, with Dr. Hamilton, if we can get one, we got one, and now we have three. So, thank you. Do, do we have uh, any literature going out to the families as far as um, do's and don'ts, tips and points? So I don't, I don't have anything that's going out to the families, but we do post on the website. So if, if Dr. <laughs> Hamilton wants us to go deeper into that and yeah. do a backpack or something like that, we'd be more than we're, we're ready to produce that information. Thanks. Any more questions? Any more questions? Thank you, Mr. Policia. Thank you. Welcome. I also, <clears throat> part of my committee report, I attended um, the Pennington Black History Mannequin um, performance um, pro program, and as always, it's a delight to go there. Um, I was the Warner Brothers donation was awesome. And that young lady who donated everything was a student at Lincoln School. So she's from Mount Vernon, but she works for Warner Brothers now. So I was very impressed with that because that was a lot of stuff. Um, I also attended Rebecca Turner's Black History Assembly, a group sponsored by the McDonald. They do, through music, the history of black history. And it was fantastic. The kids was up dancing and really enjoying everything. And I also went to Friendship um, Church for the black artist um, display. Um, they are local black artists, and they, it was, I saw a picture of you there. But they, <laughs> it, it was really very, very nice to see our, our um, local people that can um, do the art. I even bought a piece. But um, did you? you did too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I wasn't there for the performing arts. Um, they did have a display. But they did a display also. And they did they perform too? Yeah, exactly. They performed. So I had a nice little weekend visiting. So that's all. Wonderful. Thank you, Trustee White. Trustee Sanders. Um, well, the, uh, that presentation was also part of the health, the health and safety. Uh, committee meeting that you know so I wanted that to segue into that uh, so I'm also um, on the um, guidance advisory council mm -hmm. we meet the first Monday of every month at one o'clock here in the conference room and it's, and it's chaired by Dr. Kim Smith so we talked about uh, issues with L students, and I want her to come up and share with me what we discussed, if it's okay. But I'll start out. She wanted to get approval from you, Dr. Hamilton. It's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the respect of the protocol. <laughs> Since we're doing... We're getting a That should help yeah, We're doing eight, tag eight, teams, eight, right? One. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Eight, eleven, Good evening. Four. Um, of course, she's put me on the spot, but basically, um, Dr. Bennett Conroy spoke to me uh, about a month ago, and she, she, she wanted me to step up my game, and she indicated that in Yonkers, um, their graduation rate was 84%, which superseded the state average of 80%. She, in the, she told me about two articles. Come on, Dr. Benekarin, you know you challenged me. She told me, <laughs> she told me about two articles, 
and I had our committee read these articles and what they based, one of the areas that they focused on, or we focused on, was that the counselors, um, in order to facilitate the increase in the graduation rate, they focused on the e l students and the special ed students. So yesterday our conversation focused on after school programming. And for the most part, so too that Yonkers, they focused on those programs. And we, we feel that one of the difficulties that we're having, and I have not yet spoken to the superintendent about this, one of the difficulties that we're having is our neediest population, those students that are bused, don't have access to the after school programming. So they can't go to power hour. And, and so we want, we're, we're just having a discussion. We, we're looking at the fact, and Felicia, you might have had this conversation too. We're looking at the fact that they may need some assistance and we may need to consider having a, at least a late bus or some transportation so they too can receive services. Um, that's our preliminary discussion that we had yesterday. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. So also, um, I'm on the Special Education Advisory Council. Our next meeting is March 18th at, <coughs> we're gonna start at 5.30 because we're gonna have a chat and chew for an hour at Rebecca Turner Elementary School. So the chat and chew is gonna be from 5.30 to 6.30 and then we're gonna have our meeting for an hour. Our meeting's gonna be about um, summer programs for special ed. But also, um, there was a questionnaire at one of our special education advisory meetings a few months ago, and the parents were concerned or requested or wanted to know about after school programs for their children. So this, is, um, this kind of coincides with the um, advise with the um, counselors meeting and special ed. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you guys. And I know we don't we don't have a lot of money for transportation, and I know we're trying to condense transportation, but it's a conversation we need to have because we have a lot of students that want to have and go to programs, but we can't provide it. So that is the end of my committee reports. Thank you. I have one question. You said there are a lot of students who want to go to programs, but we can't provide it. Is it because they need transportation yes. from their school to the after-school program? Yes, because a lot of the special ed students don't go to their home school. Right. So the after-school program could be in another school altogether besides their home school. Is that well, yeah, I guess that's something, something else we need to talk about. How you know, And also, you know, if you don't want to talk about it, those same students may need TAs. You know, so we're talking a lot of money. So just wanted to Throw it on the table. put it out there. Just wanted to, you know, you have, we can have a conversation about it. Okay, I'm not saying. No, I think we should have a conversation. And honestly, we need to, we, uh, and this was something that I was going to uh, sort of poll the board about having round table topics. And I think that is one that is. That's been a topic of conversation for a long, long right. time. Very, very long time. I think it's time that we talk about it then at some, you know, like let's just get it on the calendar, let's get on the schedule and let's let's start talking about it and see what kind of headway we could make. And we also, uh, just, just to piggyback that, um, that was also a uh, concern brought up by the Edward Williams community last night. Mm -hmm. Is that something though that before we have a round table we should have data, maybe we can poll the parents and see who does, how, you know, what the interest is, so that way we can make a I think we have that information okay. for special ed anyway. Right. Yeah, but right. that would, like, I'd like to see that before we have the round table so we can kind of try to figure out, and maybe like the homeschool, so we can figure out what students are interested in and kind of how can we finagle that in a way that keeps it as, you know, and obtrusive as possible. Sounds like a plan. It does. Cool. All right, well, you know what? I think we need to set a date on when we can talk about it again because we talk about it and then it gets buried. So um, maybe we should have some answers at our next board meeting. How about okay. that? We'll put that on the round table. That'll yeah. be the topic okay. of our round table. Yep, got that? Okay. That's the end of my committee report. Okay, thank you, Trustee Saunders. All right. Uh, Trustee Munoz Patterson, would you like to give a report? Sure. Okay. Um, so our our audit committee was delayed um, by illness in the internal claim auditor's family, um, but to give everyone a heads up where we are, 
Our internal auditor, Tobin, is currently auditing the two departments that the committee decided to audit, which is HR and special education. Both studies are underway, and we should hopefully in a month or two have a report, and we can present it back to the board then. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Munoz Patterson. Trustee Mitchell? Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I was uh, invited to homeschool for their fifth grader play Dig a Little Deeper, which was their Black History Month presentation. Uh, got to watch the kids come out and perform. Um, and it's, uh, I was also invited by uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Van G over at uh, Grime School and uh, Jasmine Burns, the PTA president, to attend the Grime School presentation, which I unfortunately was not able to make, but uh, from my understanding, it was a very good show. Um, I want to say that <clears throat> As we see all our schools present these presentations, I think it's really amazing that they're actually preparing that segue for those students from a young age. It's that segue to perform in art school and for them to truly identify their love for all the different arts. So it was really amazing. I saw great work from fifth graders in home school uh, led by, you know, Ms. Harris and uh, Ms. Merrill and, and all the teachers that were involved. It was very enjoyable. Uh, and it's great to see our district really, you know, put our kids in that position where they can find that, that love. It was amazing. Wonderful. Thank you, Trustee Mitchell. Trustee Justino, would you like to give a report? Um, I actually comment? have some good news. Okay. Um, we I'm like gonna, news. All right. <laughs> I'm going to be attending Stony Brook for next fall. Oh, <laughs> and I plan on majoring in biology and going on the pre-med track. So... Hopefully, that will finish one day. Awesome. Congratulations. That's Yay. Thank you. Congratulations. Very good news. Okay. Trustee Williams? Um, I'd, I'd like to, well, uh, if uh, Dr. Hamilton would expand on um, the trip. So we were, our district was oh, invited yes. to um, Madison Square Garden. We had got a call, the student activities had got a call from MSG, um, the Garden of Dreams. So Madison Square Garden hosted a, um, performance of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird yes. for 18,000 New York City students yes. and they um, they called they said they couldn't they couldn't do it without having a Mount Vernon presence yes. so we uh, we made it happen and Dr. Hamilton attended and I'd like yes to Trustee Williams reached out and said, asked if we could get these kids together in transportation and we did and um, I managed to go down for a little bit just to see what the experience would be like for our kids and I was blown away I did not think it would be possible for them to be able to stage such a sensitive, delicate, intricate performance in Madison Square Garden and have our students get the message behind the story, but it was an experience they will never forget. It was the largest live performance of a Broadway show in any live audience in history, and our kids were able to be there. So thank you for making that happen for our kids, and that opportunity for them was just extraordinary. What show, what show was it? To kill a mockingbird. Oh, okay. oh, okay. It's great. Very nice. It's great. Yes. Thank you, Trustee. Very nice. They reached out to you. Yeah. Do you have anything else you want to add? Anything um, else of your? No, I just want to say hello to cabinet. We have a nice representation here. Principals, um, apparent liaisons, always want to say hello to you guys. Um, teachers, security. We have a great presence here, so just want to say hello. And obviously, with the parent liaisons, we have to. Um, we have to talk because I know you guys have a, a heavy lift right now with parents and the high um, <laughs> sensitivity, and you know you guys have been looked at and make sure. So um, whatever you guys need, let's let's sit down and make sure we um, on the same page so we can make sure the district is at ease. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Williams. Thank you, Trustee McCohen. I was able to attend uh, Trap Hagen's Black History Month uh, celebration, which was. Excellent. There was poetry and dancing and a lot of local history, uh, courtesy of City Council President Copeland. Um, and also a woman named uh, Jenny, um, Chantel Turnbull came and gave a presentation about uh, coding, which I thought was really interesting. And, and, and it was not something I expected to see, but it was so on point to encourage um, black children, especially black women, to get into the science and technology fields 
Um, and she talked a lot about, especially to the, you know, the older middle school age children, about the potential for um, the, the real need um, and disparity in job availability. Uh, there are so many jobs, and the forecast is it's only going to get more and more lucrative um, and more and more opportunities for our uh, our students to get into those fields. So uh, it was nice to have the arts, and we, we see that a lot, and I love the arts, but it was also nice to have a plug for don't forget to go get, um, don't forget that there's opportunities out there um, in making apps or whatever. She got the kids. She talked a lot about TikTok and a bunch of exciting apps, so the kids were excited about that. Um, and I had another just just an anecdotal experience. Um, my uh, my children are involved in a in a dance prog program, not not affiliated with the district, uh, private private dance program, and they have an annual uh, presentation or a, a recital every year. And it's for years it's been at this um, a very large high school in the Bronx, which uh, I don't need to say where it is, but I hate going there. It's extremely inconvenient. There's no place to park. It's a huge pain. Um, I was dreading it. And then we just found out that uh, they set the location, and the location's Mount Vernon High School. So kudos to our district for uh, being, once again, a place where we are looking for business opportunities, and they are there. So we're open for business and come rent our facilities. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Trustee McGowan. Trustee Miller, since. Uh I don't have a committee report. I, I do want to say that um, I want to thank um, uh, Rick McCormick and yourself and Dr. Hamilton for attending the Girls Inc. launch uh, the press conference today. Um, they've already gotten some coverage. I've already had been received some texts from Michelle Nicholas, uh, executive director. So I'm really thrilled that this program is starting uh, its pilot in Benjamin Turner, and I'm looking forward to working with Girls Inc. to expand it to our other schools. Okay. Wonderful. We're looking thank you, thank you, Justin Miller. We're also looking forward to the yes. uh, widespread uh, implementation of the program throughout the district. This is a really exciting opportunity for our students. So, mm -hmm. yes, thank you. Uh, Trustee Ning? I just want to talk about, uh, you know, I've, I'm so thrilled to usually Whenever I hear about success, you know, student success, because we are all here for student success, when we have students uh, getting into these colleges, these programs, you know, it's such a pleasure to hear those successes. And it brings me, uh, reminds me of what we're trying to achieve, you know, with the PCOP at the STEAM Academy, which has been, you know, in progress for the past uh, five, six weeks now, and I would invite Dr. Bennett Conroy, who is an engineer, you know, who engineered that program, to prepare a presentation, not tonight, but, you know, for our next board meeting, this way, you know, to uh, talk about the progress, uh, the courses that the students are taking, um, you know, the uh, biology which prepared them for medical school, you know, I wish you have had that because I think the students, they all love it. And we have full classes for all of them. Uh, you know, we included math this year. Last year it was only uh, science, uh, earth science, what they call environmental science, uh, biology, and computer science. This year they included math, and it prepares them for the SAT because having a good score in SAT is still is still really a good measuring stick, you know, for uh, getting into these uh, high-end colleges and, uh, you know, to get ready for college, let's put it this way. So uh, it pleases me to always hear and congratulations again. Thank you, Trustee Ning. Um, and finally, I'll give my report on the Budget Committee. The Budget Committee met on Friday, February 28th, and we received an update from Joseph McGrath, our Associate Superintendent or Director of, I'm sorry, I don't have his title. McGrath, uh, Director of Technology. Director of Technology. I couldn't get his title correct. Excuse me. Um, to get an update on the Smart School Bond and its progress and allocation to date, we talked about the purposes for it, including an uh, in, uh, intrusion detection system uh, for district-wide implementation, and we talked about uh, monies allocated for that and some additional plans to uh, 
pursue some of the payment <coughs> through an IPA, which is a payment plan through BOCES. <coughs> Let's see. Let's see what can I say? Camera. Okay. I'm sorry? Okay. We also talked about the use of the smart barn for uh, improvements to the PA system um, and uh, certain s safety measures, which would include uh, incorporating a digital swipe with a thumbprint for employees um, to ensure that people who are in the district are people who belong in the district. Um, so we continue to talk about where some of the monies have been allocated thus far and what remains. Um, and we talked about the, the amount of money that's uh, to be allocated to the non-public schools. And what else? And the, amount, the amounts of money that will be allocated for Mandela, which right now is approximately, I think it's 1.4, and approximately 700K for STEAM. Um, most of the monies will be reimbursed after the monies are spent. And um, we will need to make a decision regarding Mount Vernon High School uh, in terms of what will be implemented there. Okay. Uh, we also discussed the transportation again. This is another timely issue because there was um, an, a, re a review conducted of all of the IEPs in the district to determine which IEPs require transportation um, and which didn't, and also to determine uh, which students were being provided transportation because their uh, home exceeded the one mile threshold. And so we're still reviewing that and we had conversations about potentially having a pilot where one school would be used to determine uh, how many routes can be collapsed so that we can use lesser buses, transport all those students who are um, assigned to a home school and have the students meet at the school so that then they can be transported to their assigned schools. So um, I'll wait till you finish. Okay. Well, okay, you can ask questions about well, that I, now I, because I, this is an issue that we need to talk well, about I, as a I board. It's something I, where... I saw the proposal. I didn't know if it was going to be executed because I would think that'd be um, dangerous. I mean, if you were to bring, if you bring your, your student to um, their home school, yeah. and wait for a bus. Now, I don't know if that student is going to be able to enter that building, and if, if it's inclement weather, will that student be able to in, enter that building and wait for the yeah. bus with their parent? So these are all issues that, that, that have, these are all questions that have arisen in the course of our conversations, in the course of our discussions to try to find ways to find savings with transportation and determine who, um, how, how we're going to implement this is trying to figure out whether it's doable, whether there is um, an opportunity for us to collapse some routes, especially if there are students who, let's say, are not required to have transportation, because there are students who are not required to have transportation but are being transported. Um, so this is the sort of second level review that needs to be uh, completed in order to determine whether this is even possible. If there are students who are not required to have transportation but are being transported, is it possible to have those students meet at their home school and be transported? And I don't know for what reasons they're receiving transportation if it's not in the IEP. So I don't know whether it's because of the one mile threshold that they've exceeded. So this is a second layer of review. The review right now has, the review that's been um, conducted basically provides information on the students who are being transported um, and the reasons why they're being transported. And, and so this is not very clear, and those are issues that arose. So we don't know. Are the students going to be waiting outside? Will we need monitors waiting with them? Will they be waiting inside? And if they're waiting inside, what happens when the bus arrives? I mean, there are a lot of logistical questions that this arises. So yes, we do want to collapse routes. We do want to um, try to find efficiencies to save money that we can then take that money and put it into instruction or put it into some other services that our students could benefit from. But this is not, this has been an ongoing process and it's been, um, how can I say, it, it's not clear cut. So, and I'm calling on, I'm looking at Ken Silver because I don't know if you want to add some comments or, or say something about the process. So if you wouldn't mind approaching the podium and just adding 
some insight. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. So I, I just want to emphasize that this is only in the study mm -hmm. phase. We've done nothing but study it. We've talked about possibly having one school as a pilot school to try this out to see if it works. We've looked at where the kids, uh, their home school and where the kids go to during the day, and we've done nothing but look at it. And there's no plan to do anything but yeah. look at it right now. And uh, so this requires a lot more study. Yeah. There's no plan to do anything but study it. Right, and and if at, and so studying it, and if at some point the board decides to go through having a pilot, because we'd have to see how would it work and if it's even possible, and so that's just part of the conversations that we're having. But this is something that we need to discuss as a board because there is an opportunity for significant savings, but it's pretty complicated and it's going to continue, you know, require continu continued analysis. So, okay, I yeah. mean, So I'd like and. So you know what, I would like for, um, well, I'm going to be careful that we don't exceed the threshold, well, but I would like Whatever data you, to you have, you'd like to share it with us, and maybe we can have a conversation about that. Sure, about that. sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and what I would like, actually, is for you to attend the budget committee meeting as well, that if, you, if you're well, available. Oh, you know what, you guys meet at like 8 in the morning. Yeah. So maybe I can, in a conference call with it. Is that yeah, okay? that's fine. Absolutely, you can call in. That would be great. Well, absolutely. <coughs> okay. Um, so... Let's see. The other items we talked about were just uh, facilities, just looking at some projects that are planned for next year in response to community, community requests and concerns, specifically a chain link fence at Columbus and a couple of other uh, facilities related projects to improve uh, certain operations. And we did a preliminary review of the budget, which should be completed within the next two weeks, I believe, or by the month, by the end of the month. And we should be uh, receiving a presentation on that. Okay, our next meeting is going to be held on uh, Friday, uh, March 13th at 8 a.m. here in the district. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that concludes the budget, I mean, the committee reports. Um, and we will now move on to the next item in our agenda. So can I um, make a, uh, just an observation? I, I got a few calls about our special oh. meeting that we had last week. Yeah, I needed it, yeah. And there, were, and there were a few <laughs> items on the uh, agenda that were not public. Yeah. So a lot of people called and, and were concerned about that. Yeah. And I mentioned it to Rick, and so he could really? probably elaborate more on why we did it. <laughs> Darcy, 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 we, Darcy, we hear you. We, we want some salsa, salsa too. Also. We want some salsa too. <laughs> <laughs> we said didn't ask for bourbon. Can you, can you Trustee Torres, can you say that again? Can you repeat that? So um, apparently uh, there were some items on our agenda at our special meeting last week mm -hmm. that were not public. And everything we do should be, you know, some stuff should be public, not everything. But there are some things that were supposed to be public that were not. So and I, I brought it to Rick's attention, and he said he can elaborate on that. Okay. Contracts and things like that. <laughs> Just give him a second. Well, my mouth is very dry. <laughs> um, there were four action items on the agenda last week. Um, there were three contracts uh, for Dr. Gorman, uh, Mr. Silver, and myself, uh, as well as one personnel action item. The three contracts were uploaded to the executive content portion of the meeting as is board protocol. And once the board approves those contracts, they are then moved to the public section of, of the meeting. Uh, that's generally been the practice um, for those types of issues because they're not finalized until the board takes action on them. Okay. So they've all been since moved there. So they went uh, public after we. They approved. went public after. Yeah. They're not. They're. They're. Okay. I'm trying to say the word. Thank you. They're in technically a draft until you guys approve them. Okay. Okay. And then they, when they were uploaded, um, my per, they're slightly redacted because some of them have addresses. Um, so the addresses were redacted and removed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. All 
right. Our first item on the uh, agenda is uh, for approval is item five, the human resources tab. Uh, item 5.1, approval of human resources memorandum, number 10A and number 10B, dated March 3rd, 2020. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion. Second. 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 Okay. Second. Are there any comments, questions, discussion on this resolution? None? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. Are there any new employees in the audience this evening? Uh, Ms. Tiggs, are there any new employees? I don't think so. I didn't no? see anybody. Okay. Any unfamiliar crisis? All right, thank you. Next item on the agenda is item 6.1, approves business office memorandum number 18, dated March 3rd, 2020. Can I get a motion to approve? Motion. Second? Second. Any questions, comments, discussion? Do you need a minute? No? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Okay. Next item, 6.2. Reject bids, general construction bids, contract number one for the rebid of Grimes Annex building asbestos abatement and demolition, bid number B19-03. Can I have a motion to approve? <coughs> motion. Second. 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 Comments, questions, discussion? I had a question about this. Sure. Uh, can we just be reminded, I don't know if it's Mr. Sol or Mr. Policia, reminded um, the funds that were already, there were some funds already spent to look at this, correct? And how long do we have to eventually do something with this building and not lose the possible reimbursement? We have spent some $600,000 on fees for uh, the Grimes School to date, all of those pretty much architectural fees for the various iterations of the extension to the building. And we've spent some money on the demolition paperwork. Uh, if we do not demolish the building, we do not get state aid on the $600,000 that we spent on architectural fees. However, if we should decide at some later date to have it in another bond or to demolish the building, uh, that those fees would then possibly be eligible for state aid. But they, um, whether they're eligible or not is not the time frame, the time amount. It, it can go for, it can go on and then we decide to do something later, it becomes eligible for state aid. It really has to do with the amount you're spending. So if you're spending $700,000 to demolish the building but you have another $600,000 in fees, they may object to that, they may not. Uh, but we do know that uh, we will not get aid unless we do something there. Right, understood, but okay, so that was my question. But there's no, it's not like a deadline. Like there's not. We have to demolish the building. It can be done it. later. Okay, so at some well, point, the next, basically, they potentially could be wrapped into any major capital work done at the Grimes building, including the demolition of this building. As long as it goes through the state, yes, major right. capital at work. At some point, okay. But well, I thought that, I know at one time we had promised the community that we were going to get rid of that eyesore. Um, and it's very dangerous if kids or adults or someone gets in there. I know it was already rejected, but I have to, my conscience has to be clear that um, this building needs to come down. And we told the community that we were going to take it down, put greenery there for the school. And now we keep dragging it along. And I understand about the design feeds. I sat in those meetings. But we didn't stop him at that time about those fees. So I, 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 you know, I'm very upset about this not coming down, this building not coming down. And I'm clear on my conscience because if someone gets hurt by some chance, kids going in there doing something they don't have any business doing, then I know I, I say it should have been down. So what we've done tonight is to reject the bids. Yep. The board still has to make a decision about whether they want to proceed uh, to another bid or to, or to demolish the building or not. All we did tonight was, we're doing tonight is rejecting the bids. Uh, Mr. Silver? I have a question. It's, it's Darcy. Um, no. <laughs> is the is the uh, I thought the building was secured, and is it is it not secured? So I'm concerned about 
uh, Ms. White's, uh, Trustee White's uh, concerns that I thought it was, uh, I looked at it, I thought it was not a building that could be entered. Is that not the case? Mr. Policio is going to respond to that question. Good evening again. Um, the building is secure. I mean, it ha it's boarded, and both the, door, the doors and windows are boarded. Um, there is some locking mechanism still on one of the main doors in the back. It's a boarded, it's a boarded structure, though. It, it has limited security on it. It is <coughs> airtight as far as we are concerned now, but it, it, it always is susceptible to breach. Because it has is it ever been breached? Not to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Policia, how, how often do we do any type of checks? checks? Do we send anyone around just to make sure? <clears throat> we check it constantly from the exterior. We can't enter the building right. without protective clothing, without, I mean, it's filled with asbestos in there, so we really have to be careful going in the building. So what we do is we, we continuously inspect from the exterior. We try to keep the area around the building free of debris and we try to do the, you know, the, the landscaping. It is a little rough in that area because there are some divots and some actual voids in the exterior. We could try to do something to level that off, but that would create a cost of some sort, not, not exorbitant, but it would definitely create a cost. Yeah, I mean, we all, we, all, we all know the building has to come down at some point or be replaced. The issue is cost. It's because of the asbestos. The, the environmental cost is so high. high to demo it. It's not like you can, it's not like a shed. You can just knock down and be done. Yeah, I th we would basically have to tent the building yeah, in order to take crazy. it down. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking yeah, for sure. It's a big job. But I, it, at some point, you are correct. It, it does have to come down for sure. <laughs> I just may wanted to make my peace. You, well, you, made, you made your peace. I made my piece. We can use that money for transportation. And, I, and you know what? I, I just I want to say something because I don't think there's a question about taking the building down. Oh, I no. think we all recognize that it has to come down. And it's not as if even the, the fees that, that were um, expended to design whatever project was conceived at the time. I mean, even that potentially is aidable. It's just held in abeyance. So we're going to do it. Maybe this isn't the right time to do it, especially when we consider what our expenses are. Think about the progress we've made and think about the money that we're going to allocate for the demolition of this building. Um, what we can potentially do with that. I mean, there's so many areas in this district that could benefit from that, whether it's pedagogical instruction, whether it's facilities, whatever, but. Well, as the, as the board contemplates this, you should know that our preliminary uh, review of where we are relative to the balance of the bond, uh, we are considerably below what we anticipated. So we are significantly under budget um, in terms of the eight, one point, one hundred and eight million dollars. So I just wanted you to have that information as you contemplate the Grimes Annex. I think, uh, I think the, the public is, would definitely want to know what we're planning on doing with those funds. So I would imagine we should be having those discussions very, very quickly and very soon. Because, the, yeah. Yeah. I think Sorry to one of the things that we've discussed is maybe looking at it to split it between um, Parker and um, Williams and saying, listen, because the, the fact of the matter is, and this is what I struggle with, with saying $2 million on knocking down a building that students don't touch every day. Meanwhile, we have buildings where students are there day in and day out, and there are issues that those buildings are, that those students are facing, that those buildings have, that that million dollars per to those two buildings could make a big difference. And not to say, again, not to say it's not important, but just not today. Today, if we have that money and that money, and, and I think it also relies on the fact that let's make sure that Man, you know, Mandela is also where it is supposed to be as well with that budget to ensure that we can open it without hitting taxpayer you know, dollars in the long run, too. We've been going over and over this about this building for so long. Um, um, I just wanted to say what I had to say. I, the bids were rejected. I'm fine with that. But uh, I think something has to be done. Well, we haven't, we haven't voted yet. We have to vote to reject the bids. <laughs> Oh. Much I just want to clarify, yeah. uh, if I may, Madam sure, President, um, just so that the administration is clear, should the board reject this bid, is that synonymous with 
uh, abandoning the demolition of the Grimes Annex? I don't know that. It's just postponing it, I believe, right. not so abandoning no, it. In, in terms of direction for the administration, I just need, I just want to be clear. I just want to make sure that we're all saying the same thing, that this tab, while the tab is about the bid, connected to the bid is the authorization to do the work. And rejecting the bid is therefore saying that we mm -hmm. are delaying, at least at this juncture, should the board vote in that way, at this juncture we are postponing the demolition of the Grimes Annex. I just want to make sure that we are clear from an administrative standpoint, so we're not moving in the wrong direction. <coughs> but this is about the third bid, set of bids we've had on this building. Second. Is it? I can't see. Second. 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 OK. When was the first? I don't remember. You remember the second the round first higher or lower were? than the first? Pardon? Lower? Okay. When were the first set of bids on this um, project? Was it? A while ago, or? Mr. Austin, are you comfortable with speaking with? Did you recall when the first set of bids went out on this project? I can't remember. Was I it part of the doing the annex, or was it a separate bid? Is that why we rejected the first time? I don't remember. They Do you remember? Uh, back in June, July, we had a bid for yeah. uh, the Grimes demo, then it was rejected. Mm -hmm. Was it just the demo, or was it demo and annex <coughs> work? I don't no, remember. It's, so it's always been two specific things. Uh, once you did not proceed a year and a half ago with the addition, with the then we moved to only have uh, two components to the next project, and that was uh, required building code items in the existing building and the demo of the Grimes Annex. And SED approved with Ken Silver's uh, discussion that they would allow, because normally you cannot get aid on a building that's not occupied. So they agreed to aid the building or the demo under the building aid for the existing building. So we did the first one July, August. Then we did the we opened the bids for uh, the second one uh, January 28th of this year. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, gentlemen. You. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions or discussion? Comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstain? I have Trustee White in, in opposition. That's it? Yep. That's it. Eight okay. Yes, one no. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Next item, um, so then 6.3. Yeah. Next item, 6.3, awards bid number 19-20-04 for various HVAC repair maintenance services for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. Second. Okay. Any questions about this resolution, comments, discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Next item is the number seven, uh, 7.1, approval of school improvement memorandum number seven, dated March 3rd, 2020. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion. Second? Second. Any questions, comments? I don't think I had any comments on that. I'm gonna abstain on this one. I'm gonna abstain on this yep. one. Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? I'm going to abstain I, because of the agreement with Concordia College. My interest there. Okay. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you. Next item is item 8.1, approval of student service memorandum number 8, dated March 3rd, 2020. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion. Second? Second. Questions, comments, or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Next item, 9.1, approves buildings and grounds memorandum number 17, dated March 3rd, 2020. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion. motion. Second? Second. Any questions? Yes. Okay. Yes. Trustee Munoz Patterson? Uh, Mr. Felicia, would you please oppose the, approach the podium? Hi. 
Um, can we just go over number three? Because I remember number three is partially what we talked about, I believe. Number three being the Mandela, yeah. the big one? The Piazza Brothers, the $276,000. Mm. 327 Yeah. Right? Is that the one you're talking about? Yes, 152 um, So I am happy to report that that whole Gable issue, this is it. This is what, what you see now. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the. Are you talking about the penetrations or the gable? There are one, two, three, four. There's four for Mandela, totaling two hundred seventy-six thousand dollars on our. Yeah, can you join okay. us up here, please? Ivy Davis. And so I'm. I'm. What's the question? I'm sorry. Can we can we review them, please? Yes. Okay. So, it, you want to go through them one at a time? Is the four for me? Piazza, I would like to go through one okay. at a time, yes. Thank you. So it's this one here, right? So for 113,000 um, negotiated from 133, that's the reconstruction of the east facade, the gable, the masonry wall, and the parapet, including the bracing and the replacement of the discovered deter deteriorated steel. So that is the final portion of the gable project. Okay. Um, we showed you a demolition proposal, then it was a bracing, then it was the removal of the bracing, and now the reconstruction of the gable. And it is complete. And just to summarize where we were in relation to the estimate that we have been carrying throughout on the um, contingency summary. Mm -hmm. So where we ended up was a, a total of 317,000 related to the discovered condition of the emergency repairs, the demo, as he was describing, and now the reconstruction versus $425,000 we, that we were carrying as an estimate. So we were well below what we had been carrying as a worst case scenario. And how are we overall with the contingency? Overall with the contingency, we're at 6.7% of the 10%, which equates to a balance of 559,000 and change left. No, I I'm I'm going to hesitate asking this question, but how much of it, how much is left where we could have another big issue like this? Because I feel like theoretically we should be mm -hmm. done with most of these types of situations. Right. We should be past this point, but right. is that your feeling as well? So what we've been doing throughout um, under item C, I don't, do you guys have this handout? Yeah. No. The contingency we, summary for Mandela and Davis? It's not on. We did the last the time. time. Yes. Not this last meeting. We don't we have it now. It, yes. <coughs> but we did get that. We did. Yeah, we had it. It's not tonight. I. <coughs> so what we've we've been doing is is that as always of today? carrying okay, an yeah, estimate yeah, yeah. for potential yeah, upcoming change orders. Mm -hmm. So what you'll see on this current version, which is as of today, mm -hmm. those numbers I gave you about the balance of That's contingency are as of today. We're carrying an estimate of an additional seventy-five thousand for any potential change orders that we we foresee. Coming. So I'm sorry, we're six point something, carrying an excess of seventy-five thousand dollars. Correct. Okay. That's factored into the current six point seven percent utilized. Now, just to be clear, I'm sorry, um, just because I want to make sure I understand it. The 559,480, that's under, that is under the current, it's under the budget, with the, that's the 10%. That's including the, it's 110% of the budget. So we're 559 under when you look at 110, not, a hun, not the original, but it's including the, the contingency. contingency, yes. That is mm -hmm. correct. And then after we hit that 559, what happened? <laughs> After we, if God forbid, I don't want to put out, I don't want to say what I want to say, which is that's going to be the last big one, and we're going to be done, and then knock on wood, and all the other somebody else knock on wood too. Um, but if we have change orders totaling 650, what, ha where does that extra in terms of the budget or whatever, where well, does that hundred thousand dollars come from? So, luckily, we've been we're so under on the steam project so that's where we would have a, a another fail safe if um, the, the change orders would take us above the 10% and also now we have some Grimes money it looks like too 
Don't count the grimes money yet. Don't count the grimes money. So if you look at page two is the esteem summary of our contingency. Yeah. And we've only utilized 19% right, right. of the eight. 850,000 and change, and we have a balance of roughly 690,000. Yeah. What percentage of the work, so I guess what percentage of the work is done for both projects, give or take? Uh, roughly 65% on Mandela. Uh, actually, probably both. Yeah, both jobs are tracking on the same path because they were more or less awarded around the same time. And both on September 1st, I think. Correct, correct. And just one clarification. Uh, you had said of 110% of the budget, it's it's 100% because the 10% contingency was factored into the overall budget. Okay. That's it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Any more discussion? On this, no, okay. Sorry, I'm, look, I'm just. You, you, have, yeah, you need to. I mean, yeah, I thought I'm so. I saw you reading. One thing. If, yeah. Not so fast, Mike, Mr. Pelicio. Yeah. If we allow you another two months, would you save another hundred eight thousand? <laughs> we'll try our best. <laughs> uh, um, I had a question about which one is this? This is. In the category number one, the change order for change order number ten for renew <coughs> for nine thousand two hundred dollars. Is this? Just tell me when you get there. Oh. So, um, yeah. So that. That room is an old band room. It's 1,700 square feet. It's a monster of a room. Large room. Yeah. That was so, my question. Right. Yeah. And so that's why it was so costly. It's a really expensive drywall yeah. job. Yeah. But okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Micah, do you need a few more minutes? So no. you're good? I'm okay. Ready. All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, motion carries. All right. All right, the next item on the agenda is uh, item 11, Board of Education acceptance of minutes for the meeting of December 10th, 2019. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion. Second? Second. Second. Any questions, comments, corrections, revisions? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Next item is acceptance of minutes for the meeting of December 19, 2019. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion. Second? Second. Questions, comments, discussions? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? I motion. abstain. Okay. Mr. McOwen abstains. Okay, motion carries. Next item is in item 11.3, adoption of goals. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion. motion. Second. Second. Okay. Do we have any discussion, comments, questions? Let's discuss. Mr. McGowan? Yeah, let's discuss. let's discuss. I think we should take this opportunity to discuss our goals and finalize them. We actually don't have a roundtable discussion this evening, so if we want to spend some time doing this, so we, can. We, go. we can use this as uh, the forum to finalize our goals. So this draft uh, goal, this is the third internal draft. We have, we've, we've done some at various um, retreats we've had. We've gone over this um, in executive content. There's some comparisons to other drafts we've worked on in previous. Uh, and the public draft is um, the proposed draft for adoption tonight. So does anybody have any thoughts or revisions or... Um, oh, Rick has some hard copies if you want to look at it on paper. Uh, one thing the um, so the, in comparing to our current you know 2020 vision goals uh, I'm sorry they were a kind of I don't, I don't wanna how do I say this uh, it was it was kind of brief. The actual goals were not very lengthy. They were very ambitious, <laughs> and we accomplished them all. 
um, and are in the middle of finalizing the accomplishments. Um, I'll have a few of them, but basically we accomplished them all. This time we talked about many different things uh, at our various retreats, uh, and as we kind of tried to distill what was the most, we all had obviously different opinions about um, priorities on how to uh, spend our resources and, and how to focus our efforts, but we, we after many discussion over uh, four, four or five months now total, um, we've, we've distilled it down to a few goals, but I think in this round, uh, we were trying to be more detailed and a little bit more specific so that we can hold ourselves more accountable. Um, and we also specifically wanted to adopt goals that are long term uh, so that, that are not just stuff to accomplish next year or the year after, but goals three, four, five years from now um, out. And I think in general, I'm just saying that I think kind of revisiting long-term strategic goals for the district about every five years is like a, a pretty good idea, I think. Um, and we started the 2020 vision about five or six years ago, so this is now um, the thoughts we had moving forward. So that's, that's what it is by way of introduction. Anybody want to talk about specific goals? I had a question on um, student achievement goal 1.3. Yes. Which is 9th through 12th grade. Um, do we know what the, where we are now? You're saying by 2025, we'll be at 80. Where are we now? Do we know? The four-year cohort? We're at 70% this year. OK. That high? That's great. I thought we were in the 60s. No, we, we just confirmed we, we it was just 60 confirmed? with the, yes. The, we got the data on the August cohort as well. Excellent. That's great. So that's, that's, that's less than Two percent growth a year, right? If we if we if we're looking at ten percent growth in five years, two percent two percent a year, I guess. What's the state average? 80. What is the state average? Eighty. Eighty. Yeah. So I think our goal was to be, again, at or above average there. So. I'll just remind everybody that when I first joined the board, it was 47%. So, kudos. Yep. Got it. Are there any other comments or questions regarding the goals? Did Any revisions? Anything? No? I just wanted to call specifically 2.3. That was one we, we talked a lot about and <laughs> talked a lot about the wording. Is everyone okay with the wording specifically of of that one. We were trying to convey that we have our separate high schools and they have different focuses, but we want to make sure two things. We want to make sure that we have, um, that they're being treated equitably to, to the extent possible, um, and that we don't, uh, that we have equal rigor, I think was the point. And that, a lot of things go into that. That's um, how our AP course offering is distributed among diff the high different high schools and um, extracurricular opportunities and how do sports interact with the different high schools and all these things play into that um, but without going into a laundry list uh, which would inevitably leave things out we tried to kind of be a little bit generic with that wording um, but in the second sentence we focus on Mount Vernon High School which we've all talked about is we really want it to be um, a place of opportunity in every sense of the word, including diverse um, pathways to graduation, and that, that a lot of different things go into that. That's not just, it's obviously the career technology programs that we've been uh, slowly rebuilding, um, but all, and the IB program that we're now starting, um, but really trying to think outside the box and capture every student in the best possible way. No, the only last specific question I had was Dr. Hamilton on the 2.4, which is um, trying to, I, we, we can't measure everything that happens after people, kids graduate or whatever, but in terms of what we can measure uh, internally for our graduating classes, is this, we can, I assume, this is all stuff we can measure, and the other question I had is, is 75% the right 
number I, that was in brackets when we last talked about this? I think that's it's I mean a right number. It is a reachable number. I think the um, process that we just have to tighten up on is how we track it and how well we use um, Naviance in order to to help us capture that data. But in terms of the number, um, you know, once we we ha don't have our preliminary data on that to establish a benchmark, so that I think yeah. that is the first step. If we find that when we conduct that review. Um, that that number is is unrealistic or unattainable based on our starting point, then I'll come back to the board and ask you to reconsider it. Um, I mean, basically, right, if you look at goal 1.3 is we want, within five years, we want 80% of all our students graduating within four years. And then 2.4 is of those percent that are graduating, what percentage are established going forward? They have a plan, right? Either they have a technology certificate or they're on their way to college or something. Yes. Yeah. That makes sense. <clears throat> okay. So I have a question regarding 2.2, yeah. the holistic student wellness and success, giving our um, goals to make sure that everything we do is data driven and evidence based and informed by our progress. How are we planning or how is it possible to measure the uh, results of some of this training that we're going to provide with respect to the holistic student wellness and success? Just curious. Well, there is there's always qualitative data that we can um, gather through uh, survey information, through our PBIS initiative, which is well rooted in the district. Um, tracking discipline referrals and seeing what those, dis those discipline referrals reveal relative to the kinds of things kids are being disciplined for. Um, and I think ultimately the better students are holistically related to mental health, the more likely it is we'll see some of these issues that this, this particular uh, goal represents will, will decrease. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, to to uh, Dr. Hamilton's uh, point and some other trustees, we. This is obviously very lengthy, right? We're not going to, um, we don't need to paste this entire single text page at the front of every um, banner at every school. <laughs> um, but again, we, we, we were trying to be detailed to hold ourselves accountable so that we don't just say, oh, it's a goal to be, you know, like to have a great successful school district. We needed to be um, very specific, I think, and we did. So that when the time comes, three, four, or five years from now, whoever's on the board, whether it's us or somebody else, can look back and have something very concrete to measure against um, and to give ourselves guidance as we go along. But I think in terms of, uh, I think it would be helpful, and I'm happy to, dra to draft uh, what I'll call a, an a, a abbreviated version of this. We can kind of just keep it at the forefront of what we do um, to make sure that we're driving. You know, because Dr. Hamilton, I mean, for those who don't know, like, He's very focused on the board goals, and it's always at the forefront of everything we do. And whenever we get board agendas and confidential information or whatever, it's all tied to a goal. Um, mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we continue to do that, again, to keep ourselves, that we're always making sure that we're not getting off on the wrong track. Uh, and everything we do and everything we think of is, is, is tied back to the goals we set out. Great, thank yeah. you. I just wanted to mention something since you talked about accountability. So we as a board also have to be accountable. This is one of the ways we do it. But I also think that we should um, engage upon a process of board self-review and self-assessment and, and hold ourselves accountable just like we hold the cabinet and the district and everyone in it. Um, so that's something else that I think I would like everyone to think about it because it's something that I've been thinking about, uh, ways for us to do it. I don't know whether we'll do it by, a, you know, start it with an evaluation and then having some uh, board feedback and communication. But I think that that should also be part of this process. So just food for thought. I'd like to come back to that at some point in the future and plan it. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question on 2.1. I don't have my notes with me from our last discussion on the goals. But on the, um, the individualized data, we do have a uniform system that I know works for all our pre-K to eights, but does this also, does, I, is my recollection that we do have a system that works for the high schools as well, or is that in development? I can't recall. It's, it's a combination of both. It is, we are looking at 
how we can either expand uh, the MFR process and to make it more focused, but we also have to identify data streams that help us capture the data for the uh, high school level students because right now there aren't a lot of formative or summative assessments that are being used to capture that data. So when, 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 when is our goal to have some of those streams identified? So when do we think we can start tracking that realistically, Dr. Hamilton? I'm just curious. We're, we're working on that now in the curriculum committee and looking mm -hmm. at various assessment instruments just to monitor and measure our success with various programs at the secondary level. So I'm hoping that by the time we, we wrap this up and we have our summer work sessions, we'll have it revised by, ready by then. Great. That's excellent. Thank you. Dr. Ning. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to comment and thank Michael uh, for taking the leadership in putting this together and working you know, uh, constant, uh, constantly on it and also uh, to bring uh, atten the attention to you know, some more measurable goal, especially at the high school, like the 2.3. Um, you know, if we don't put something that is there, people will not be aware that this is uh, not a goal. For instance, uh, increasing the number of students uh, taking AP courses uh, this is a good measure of success, of student success, those AP courses. So, mm -hmm. uh, and having it there and having, you know, will make the principal and the administration see that this is the goal that we would like to, uh, to reach. And then, you know, they will work, they know that, you know, they will work on it. Now, I understand uh, creating the multi, um, uh, this, you know, the non-traditional pathways and so on. There too, we can be a little bit more specific. I think it will help, uh, you know, the administration point to exactly perhaps you know what to uh, what to address there. So um, again, you know, for me, it is a very important and critical point to have uh, you know those um, that statement inserted within 2.3. Which, can you just be specific? What do you want to yeah, add? Yeah, increase the number of students taking AP classes. So tracking, tracking that and increasing yeah, yeah. it. So yeah. exactly, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's a critical element for career, for college readiness. You know, college and career readiness. So, and I know they're working on it because in the education committee, uh, Dr. Satish, uh, you know, has a plan. And I don't know if he has presented it to the board here, where you know he kind of outlines and uh, put a roadmap from middle school. You know the courses that they take, advanced placement, advanced courses they take in middle school, all the way you know to high school to 12th grade. So, uh, but again, you know we are putting out goals that the superintendent is going to work on it. He's going to put his finger on it and say. This is something that's important for us to measure because it's visible, it's measurable, you know, so. What, what's really, I think, what the community will really appreciate about um, uh, these board goals is that, you know, you, you look at them and they all look to combat the school to prison pipeline. Um, some really key indicators that we've been focused on, focusing on um, nationally that, you know, the information is there. And for this board to really kind of focus in, I, I think we, we're right on track uh, with our goals, with um, <coughs> realistic, you know, realistic goals. Realistic goals looking at where we are, where we've been, and where we're going and you know what it means to every student in this district and every family um, i think it's a great uh draft with with the um edits i think the community is proud of these, these goals so so do we want to well it, dr Ning, just, would it work if we just said it just says rigorous educational experience including ap courses to make clear that we want those at every school 
That's, that's the point, right? Yeah, they have AP courses, but when we looked at the data the last time, uh, there were very limited number of students taking those AP courses. And increasing it takes, it's a process, you know, and uh, it's a process that starts early on. Um, so when you have that goal, it has other ramification, you know, at the, you know, below all the way to even third grade. Uh, so I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good measure of career readiness and college readiness. So uh, you how, go how? to most high schools, um, you know, they, it's, it, I don't, just don't want to talk about the specialized high school. I want to talk the other general high school, especially in the suburbs, they have offerings for almost every, you know, course, you know, um, at all, you know every discipline for these AP courses. Uh, what, you know, keeps our students from getting that? Um, you know, so, to me, so, so, yeah. so to do that, we're going to need to, I think we're going to need to establish, A, how many students are taking them now, right? And then B, how much of an increase we want each year, just as we've done with some of the other academic achievement goals. Does that make sense, Dr. Ming? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. For me, just having the words there would make sense, even whether we say 5%, 10%. I believe mm -hmm. in the, the last time we looked at the numbers, how many did we have? 39 or something like that? You know, but Dr. Satish did provide us with the number of students who are taking those AP courses. And sometimes it's the same students taking right. two or three courses. Right. right. You know? It is, yeah. yeah. Right, so, so sometimes that's a natural limitation on how many you can even yeah, do. Exactly. You have to have a critical number of, of right. students to even have it work. Right, exactly. <clears throat> I mean, I'm pretty sure the STEAM Academy will, will you know, will get those courses, however, the high school, we're talking about, you know, mostly the high school, too, uh, with the introduction of the IB program, I'm pretty sure we'll develop, uh, you know, more AP courses, or we will see more students taking those tracks. Well, is that going to be the case, or is it going to be the reverse? Is it going to be that the kids who who would be populating the AP courses are going to be in the IB program? Do we, Dr. Gorman, do we know how that... Do we have any sense of how that's going to play out, do we think? There's, it's still not on. I think there's a number of indicators. Okay. Testing, testing. Yeah, no, okay. I think there are a number of indicators that will help us get there. One of the things that um, Dr. Ning that we've looked at in the Education Committee is by moving all of our kids to more rigorous <coughs> courses in eighth grade, that gives them access to higher level courses at the high school. So the better we do it with the elementary cohorts coming up, the better they, we prepare them in Algebra 1 in a living environment in, in the K-8 environment, the more access they then have at the secondary level. Um, each school has its own path to rigor, mm -hmm. and they use, in a lot of um, times, AVID as a bridge to rigor, because how do you get to rigorous courses? It's easy enough to put them in there, but then they have to be successful. The SL and the HL courses at the high school are rigorous courses as defined um, equivalent to a AP courses. So just open access to the IB, those types of courses for kids, and the work they're doing will naturally take them up to the next level. Um, we have ways to track um, where we are now and where we are each year and the movement. So I'm not worried about progress indicators to get towards more, more rigorous courses. Um, that is one of the main indicators of secondary avid is the access to rigorous courses. It's, it's the number one indicator on becoming college and career ready. Yeah, and I know that, that that's the reason why we use the word rigorous is that um, is it, is it appropriate to say more AP courses or just more rigorous courses? Well, I don't know, I want to use the right terminology. Well, when you, when you say more rigorous, it makes it less measurable than having it very specific, you know, to know what you talk about measurable uh, <coughs> courses you're talking about. So, uh, you know, it, it's not just, well, it's two ways. Increasing the number of AP courses, you can increase it and still have a limited number of students taking them. But having more students taking, you know, uh, be offering more, uh, getting more uh, students 
getting more students to take these courses, uh, you know, would show really, you know, these, uh, this progress uh, that, um, you know, something that we have not had for a long time. Um, so it's, it's about the number of students being ready, you know, be, having the, and I wouldn't say the ability, but the opportunity to take them and be able to be there and perform. You want to say increased AP participation? Could that covers be. both, right? Yes, yes. More opportunities mm -hmm. and well, that's good. And that's some good. evidence that it's actually working. That's good. IB, um, AP, and dual enrollment would be indicators of okay. students that's reaching what I did. higher, mm -hmm. higher achievement moment. standards. The, the, those would be how you define rigor right. Right. through those courses. And we could give you a list of what rigor equates to. Yeah, I don't. I'm, it's already long enough. I don't think yeah. we need to like. <laughs> no, but in, as, as a processing tool, so we know. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yes, so to reach know. that, yes. Yeah. So what do you do we want to say? In, um, including participation in AP. What do we What do we say? Dual enrollment. Dual and enrollment IB. and what was the IB other one? is already here. Yeah, yeah that's Flexible fine. Flexible scheduling mm -hmm. the IB program. So yes, you know. So we're gonna edit this right now. Yeah, right yeah. now, and then if everyone approves, we can adopt it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Comprehensive and rigorous. That's fine. And we'll be fine. Because we now have our partnership. Mm -hmm. we're Including. For more. Great. So increased mm -hmm. participation in AP. Sorry, what was the list again? AP. Dual enrollment and, and dual enrollment. Dual enrollment. And IB and is already in here. And dual IB, enrollment right? in IB. <coughs> Excuse me. AP. And IB is already on that bottom, so I don't know if you want to just Dual restructure that. Moment. And we have IB already down. Yeah. <laughs> just in the first sentence. I'm just going to <laughs> Dr. Casey also mentioned that um, the kids that are taking college courses with the partnership between mm -hmm. and, and, right. and, and Lehman, those count as rigorous courses. Absolutely. Well. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So that should be in here. It's more rigorous than AP. <laughs> okay. So do you want to read um, the revised? Yeah, we're just adding like six words. Six words, okay. Um. And then what we refresh and we'll all get it? Or? Can okay. you do that live? Yep. Okay. Okay. While he's typing, Let's take a moment and <laughs> applaud our administration and recognize the significance of what it means that we are putting forth new goals, meaning that we achieved our goals, the 2020 goals. There are no more. We're done. We did it. Yep. <laughs> okay. We're not done yet. Yeah. <laughs> we still have the bond left to finish. But. How about? <coughs> so I have to close out of my, uh, and refresh, then go back in, yeah. refresh it. Okay. And while so we have a minute, I would like to, for us to wish um, Ben Conroy a happy birthday. Oh. <laughs> yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. <laughs> okay. Is it done? <laughs> okay. All right. So if you yeah, check your, for mention. those of us who are looking, it's there. You're fine. Okay. So does everyone need a minute just to read the revised text? Do you want to take a minute to read it? Sure. Can you just read it for everybody's uh, reference and then we can vote? 2.3 now reads, diverse pathways to secondary success. Each of the Mount Vernon City School District high schools will equitably provide students with a comprehensive and rigorous educational experience, including increased participation in AP, dual enrollment, and IB programs, but provide diverse <laughs> pathways to explore interests and achieve success and graduation. Mount Vernon High School in particular will become a leading institution in offering non-traditional pathways to graduation and post-graduation graduation success, including career, vocational training, college partnerships, flexible scheduling, and the International Baccalaureate Program. Great. Okay. Yep. That's, That's great. great. Yeah, mine didn't update either. 
Oh, okay. I think that's, this is the part that you voted on. Okay. Alrighty. Gotcha. Okay, okay so okay. let me give everybody a minute to read. Do you want to? Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Is everybody clear? Any, yeah. Did you? Yeah. Good. Ready? ready? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. That concludes our resolution and our roundtable discussion for this evening. It actually worked out to be an impromptu, timely uh, discussion. So next we're going to move into executive session. So uh, do we have a... Yes. To enter into yes, ma'am. We have. Uh, we need a motion to enter an executive session this evening uh, to discuss the uh, particular the employment history of a particular person or persons, receive legal advice, and and discuss negotiations with a third party. Can I have a motion? To move to motion. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. How long will we need? Uh, no. Yes. Yeah. So. Our last item on the agenda is item 14.1, authorization to begin a disciplinary proceeding against a tenured employee. Can I have a motion to approve? Yes, you can. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Second. Second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Night, everybody. Night.